I find that for myself as a cinephile, I see that a movie came out in the late 70s or early 80s, and that itself counts for me as a point in its favor. I don't know why exactly, but it's that window of time. It always it makes a movie self-recommending in a sense, and I have a feeling you might know more about why that is than anyone else I could talk to. Do you have a hypothesis? Well, it would be something I would invent on the spot, but I, I, <laughs> I think it was, in a way, the last time that things seemed to be wide open. Uh, old-fashioned studio Hollywood was rapidly falling apart. A lot of things were rushing into fill the void. And there was a period of a good 10 years there before uh, the real codification started again with Spielberg and Lucas, which somehow seemed to make Hollywood movies in, in particular you know, infinitely worse than they were before. <laughs> yeah, I think it was just a, time, a real possibility. A lot of stuff that had been forgotten was coming back because of uh, the film societies that were popping up in the early days of video. Um, access to a lot of stuff that had been hard to see for a while and a lot more foreign stuff coming across too and the you know, festival circuit getting much bigger uh, more things on display I think for, for, for quite a few years there This is the Marketplace of Ideas from KCSB in Santa Barbara and Colin Marshall Radio. I'm Colin Marshall, and I'm speaking with Dave Kerr, who writes about film for the New York Times. He's been a critic for the Chicago Tribune and Chicago Reader, and he's got a new book out that collects his reviews from his time at the Reader, some of the select ones of select films. It's called When Movies Mattered, reviews from a transformative decade, and that decade is 1974 through 1986, so a little bit longer than that, but it does overlap this period that that I watch any film I can from. But, you know, more importantly, more to the point about this book, tell us about the kind of critic you were during that time. Well, I was a very young critic during that time, uh, really just mid-20s, out of college, stumbled into uh, the film journalism because I didn't really want to go to graduate school, <laughs> and kind of finding out, you know, what my tastes were and what I thought about movies uh, on a daily practical basis by, by writing about what I've been seeing. And so how much, how much did you go in with as far as, you know, as far as the, the degree to which your time at the reader began as a sink or swim kind of affair, how much, how much of a background with the love of film did you, did you start off with? Oh, that goes back to my uh, really earliest childhood memories. Mm. Just uh, remember being hypnotized by seeing uh, DeMille's uh, Ten Commandments in a drive-in theater. And I, as near as I can tell, I was three years old. My first really vivid memory of a movie. And the medium just seemed to have a real, I don't know, hold on my, uh, my consciousness. Um, when I got old enough to uh, start going to movies on my own and, you know, finding stuff on, on television, uh, it just fed that obsession. Uh, the circles got wider and wider. I started buying uh, eight millimeter films, which were the VHS cassettes of the day back in the, in the yes. 60s, and studying uh, particularly silent comedies, uh, Laurel and Hardy and, and Chaplin and Keaton, uh, almost frame by frame on a well, literally frame by frame on a little editing machine that I, that I had. Now, we listen to that today, and that sounds like it takes cinephilia to a new level, getting an 8mm print and watching it on an editing machine at home. This isn't like loading something up on Netflix. I mean, how, how unusual was that, even among the film lovers you knew in those days? I didn't personally know anybody else who was that obsessed with it, but there were, there were certainly <laughs> companies that catered to uh, film collectors. There's an outfit called Blackhawk Films that's still in existence, uh, at least its name is, uh, as a, a distributor of, of silent films. And uh, apparently they did a, a very nice business uh, uh, selling these things. I spread 
most of my 12th year of mowing lawns uh, trying to earn enough money to buy the 15 real copy of Intolerance that they had for sale, which I could never <laughs> afford. It was like, you know, 45 bucks or something. Uh, it just, it dying to get my hands on that thing so I could, you know, go over it. Uh, you know, it wasn't until I got a DVD copy, God knows, 30 years later that I finally was able to pick through that film as closely as I wanted to. The, the critics I talked to on the show, some of them during the early days of their development of their cinephilia, there seems to be this, this impulse that they, they're operating under, like they watch their favorite films, they watch any films, and they think, I have to know how this works. It's like you're taking apart a gadget. Was that the same feeling you had? Oh, yeah, it was a real nuts and bolts thing. I wanted to take the engine apart and see how it worked on the persistence of vision level and then on how you connect the shot to the next shot, how you create rhythm, how you create that illusion of, you know, sheer invisible continuity. The whole thing just fascinated me. And the one way you learned about it was to, you know, study it uh, very slow and very close up. And now this gets into, this gets into, I guess, a divide between critics and filmmakers, but it's a fascinating one to me because I have both types of people on the show. I enjoyed equally talking to both critics and filmmakers, but a, a filmmaker, it seems to me, will will do th- maybe do the same thing with an eye toward I want to replicate this myself. But a critic, a critic has something else going on. I, you know, I I feel like a critic does this without thought to I want to make this. Just it's like a raw, pure curiosity. Was that your experience? I guess it was. Yeah, a lot of people ask me. Oh, you didn't ever want to make movies, or when am I going to make a movie? And I've got to say, the thought just never really crossed my mind. It, it wasn't what I was interested in. I wanted to know how these things worked um, and why they had this effect on me, emotionally, intellectually, uh, as well as just enjoying handling the physical materials, which is probably what I miss most in the video age. Is There's no more contact with celluloid. I still miss the way it it feels and the way it smells and you know as as a thing uh film is something that's almost completely disappeared and i i regret that for some reason for me you know i've i haven't done a whole lot of handling of actual film a little bit in filmmaking but it's see the main thing i miss when i watch something on digital projection and tell me if this is the same for you but it's the uh the, what they call the cigarette burns in the corner with the real changes somehow i i never thought i would miss the real yeah. changes but i miss the real changes it's true, and the academics are calling that the, the haptic element these days, and I know exactly what they mean. It's just uh, there's an odd pleasure in the little scratch marks, the little uh, dust bites, the little bits of nitrate deterioration that go by. Uh, again, the existence of these things as physical objects is uh, is something I always liked, and I, and, I, and I miss it, you know, now that it's it's all been digitized and taken away from us and put in the cloud or wherever it currently resides. <laughs> But you have you have this background then in childhood of buying these eight millimeter prints, looking at them, you know, in, in a sense taking them apart uh, through uh, through viewing them on this editing machine, a frame at a time, or however you're doing it. And you know, you you make your way from this to writing criticism for the public. And when you started writing criticism and having it published, how did you? I mean, what can you remember about how you conceived of the the job of criticism? Did you think of it as reporting? from the viewer's seat in a film? Did you think of it as explaining film? Did you think of it as clarifying for yourself your reactions and thus, you know, if someone else likes it, great. How did you think about criticism? I'm not sure if I thought about it in that way much at all. Uh, I started writing for the college paper at the University of Chicago when I was uh, an undergraduate and I was running the, the film society. And I guess it was a way of talking about the stuff that, uh, we were going to show how it related to the things that were coming out in the theaters at that moment. Never been that theory oriented, and I would be hard pressed to tell you today uh, why I do what I do. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> well, who can? I mean, ultimately, that's that's kind of for other people to to explain or try to. I mean, it's sort of like it's sort of like uh, is there is there an analogy here? As a critic, it would be like trying to explain the why 
of a director. You can explain the how, but the why might be a little trickier. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, it's something that always remains mysterious, particularly when you get into you know, really obscure corners of American uh, genre filmmaking, and you see the accomplishments that people like Edgar G. Ulmer or John H. Hauer were, were doing in these tiny, tiny, uh, not even D movies, uh, C movies, D movies that <laughs> no one was going to see that could possibly appreciate what, what they were up to. And yet, you know, they work with just total dedication as if this stuff is going to be, you know, hung in the Metropolitan Museum the next week. And I'm always uh, so touched and so impressed by that kind of intensity. Uh, and I find so much of it in American film. It's, it's uh, continues to surprise me how many creative people there were and how much serious work they were doing. It is, as I was saying in the beginning, you know, I, I will impulsively watch a late 70s, early 80s movie, but specifically with American film, I is if somebody asks me what I think was the best time for American film, I just come back and say the 70s. Like like I was saying, the earth is round. Or like I was saying, you know, we're breathing oxygen. Like it's one of these facts that I I say it in a way that I expect I expect it to be... I, I guess I expect no no counter argument. You know what I mean? And I you I can bring out you know history of the, what they call the new Hollywood and all that. But I mean, mm-hmm. is, is it well founded for me to just come back with this impulsive kind of? Oh, obviously the seventies American film was the best then. I mean, it's there's no question. I mean, should I be that arrogant? I guess that's what I should say. I it's very hard to say what any decade would put it above any other decade because there's so many gaps still in our knowledge of of American film, you know, particularly the silent era where I believe the usual figure is, you know, 90% of what was made has been lost. Mm. It's very likely that the most interesting period in American film is between 1915 and 1920, which is when the language really got developed, you know, with the incredible advances being made year to year. And we have so few films remaining from that period. It's, it's unbelievably frustrating, you know, and it's something that scholars in no other field seem to face is the disappearance of the primary material. A lot of the reason the 70s loom large in our imagination is because most of that stuff continues to be available. Um, the studios are still more or less keeping it in release, whereas even uh, 60s, 50s, 40s stuff is becoming more and more difficult to see as the studios lose interest in keeping their library titles in circulation as uh, television broadcasts become more rare as the revival houses close. It's uh, a continual struggle, I think, to uh, to keep film history alive. That would be one of my motivations for continuing to write. Just trying to keep people aware that there is more to movies than what's out this week or what even was out this decade. It's it's uh, you know a, an art form that has a hundred years of history to it, and it's all pretty compelling history. And there's an important example to go beyond America for a moment in your book is you have an article in here on the the whole chunk of the book that is devoted to Jean-Luc Godard. You have an article on a film from 1980, which has become known in the English-speaking world as Every Man for Himself. And only now are people really getting a chance in America to watch this film again. I myself just saw it for the first time recently at right. the LA County Museum of Art because it played there like five times in a weekend and it's touring around. I, I'm not sure what has brought it back, but it's it's a film I, I enjoy a lot, you know, and I'd never been able to see mm-hmm. it before, but it's a film that also my only contact with it for my whole life has been through criticism, through writing on the film. I mean, is is that also an act of keeping something alive, a movie that people are seeing again, but one which, to which they've lost access for a prolonged period? Well, I hope so, yeah. Uh, mm. and that's a good example of the kind of thing that is disappearing. Uh, the uh, studio that owned the American rights didn't renew them. Actually, I know the guy. His name is Jake Perlin. He's a programmer at the Brooklyn Academy of Music who started a little distribution company of his own and acquired that uh, couple of other films, and he's you know makes one print, circulates them to museums, and I think makes enough money to pay for his print and probably not much more. But it's no longer an industrial 
system. It's it's very much uh, interested individuals who have the time and patience and are not profit motivated to to rediscover the stuff and get it back out there so it can be seen. And I want to draw on. I don't know if this is going to be a question for your critical mind or your as as a, as a historian of film or what, but you know, a film like Godard's Every Man for Himself, which when I watched, I found you know exciting and fun and very 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 still fresh in a in a certain cinematic sense. You know, it wouldn't be out mm-hmm. of place today. It's all, everything I, I want from the best of Godard. I was thinking to myself, geez, you know, if if a movie like this can get lost at least in the English speaking world for so long, you know, what can't? How could how could it get lost? Was this merely an issue of it falling between some sort of legal ownership cracks or what what do you think went on there? I'm sure it was purely an economic decision. I mm. often I can't remember the company that first released it here. I think it may have been uh was it Coppola's company, Zoetrope? He had a little distribution out of it for a while. It's possible. Whoever had it, they went out of business. They no longer had any reason to want to renew the rights that they contracted for with the French producers. So the film drops out of sight in America. Uh, this happens all the time. Things just vanish. Prince exists. Uh, you can go to Europe and see them. You can pick them up on European DVD, but here... They're just gone. Now, I almost don't want to know this, but I can imagine if if I gave you an hour straight, you could just rattle off movies like Every Man for Himself that have gotten lost and are currently lost that have no one right now to revive them. Um, yeah, I probably could. You know, it would be a very boring hour, but <laughs> they're just uh, such a, a huge number of, of, of things, um, largely as a result of the market shifting. Um, the thing that scares me the most right now is this very widespread notion that, you know, quote, everything is available on the Internet, unquote, you know, at, at the touch of a button. And I've read this from absolutely some of the best-known critics in the States, you know, things like any movie I can think of, I can just reach out and find it on the Internet. And nothing could be further from the truth. I think Netflix probably has 30 or 40 films available from the entire decade of the 30s. Mm. which is, you know, 0.0001% of what was made. And you know, apart from Warner Brothers and Sony, which owns the uh, Columbia Film Library, uh, the studios have just basically dropped these films. Um, they don't put them out on DVD. They don't license them to television. They don't make new prints for the revival theaters. And, you know, now we're in the two or three generations of this, so people... You can't miss what you don't know exists, and I'm afraid that's what's happening now, is uh, people don't know how much they're not seeing. So then a part of the critic's job becomes to say, simply, this exists. You know, this not even, not even you can go get this somewhere, not even this is, here's why this is great, but this is. Oh, absolutely, is. yeah. I just, you know... I'm much less interested in opinions and interpretations than I am in, you know, show me something I haven't seen or, you know, point the way to a director I don't know about. There's just so much good, good stuff out there that's lying uh, neglected and, and, and unseen and unexplored. And I think my main job these days is writing the DVD column for the New York Times on, on Sunday, uh, which I've tried to turn into really a, a column about film history, you know, dependent on what's coming out that week, opening that up into different ways of talking about uh, past films, past directors, uh, movements. Uh, there's an immense amount of material that uh, is being very tragically neglected. Now, writing, writing on DVDs, I want to get a sense of if, to you, that is... The the DVD format is simply the way many, perhaps most people, are watching films, and therefore, uh, the 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 one of the important ways to write about films, as in what's available on DVD. Or is there is there any interest that you have in the medium itself? Like, is is the the DVD medium interesting to you, or is it merely a a vehicle for films, and it just happens to be the one most used? Well, with both things, uh, it's a trade-off. Um, 
visually, obviously, DVD doesn't come anywhere near the quality of a 35 millimeter nitrate print shown on a 40 foot screen in a 3,000 seat theater. And those days aren't coming back, so forget it. But you can get a decent idea of what a movie is. Uh, Godard somewhere talks about you know, video being like the reproduction in an art book of a famous painting. You can get a sense of what it was, even though it isn't the real, the real object. One of the points where Walter Benjamin was very wrong was when he said that movies were a reproducible art, which they are not. You know, they, they are incredibly fragile. There's only a certain number of original prints, and once those are gone, you know, the qualities that uh, the original audience has appreciated that the original filmmakers placed in them are no longer visible to us. On the other hand, uh, DVDs offer this incredible opportunity for the supplementary soundtracks, the, the, the commentaries, alternative versions, um, documentary material. You know, and we've seen companies like Criteria, you know, really go to town with that sort of extra content. Something I'm afraid we're going to lose as DVDs fade into on-demand streaming. I hope that technology evolves where that kind of thing becomes possible too, but right now, eh, it seems kind of doubtful. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas, and I'm Colin Marshall. My guest is film critic Dave Kerr, who's written for the Chicago Reader, the Chicago Tribune, and the New York Times. He's got a new book out called When Movies Mattered, Reviews from a Transformative Decade. If you'd like to hear this conversation again when it's over, visit ColinMarshallRadio.com or iTunes and search for the Marketplace of Ideas. Whether on iTunes or on ColinMarshallRadio.com, you'll find the complete Marketplace of Ideas interview archive completely free for the download. Questions, comments, feedback, guests, suggestions, anything, send those along straight to me at Colin, C-O-L-I-N, at ColinMarshallRadio.com. That is Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Now, back to the conversation with Dave Kerr on the Marketplace of Ideas cultural conversation of the depth you demand. Now, we've had, we've had Godard come up in two separate contexts, so I don't want to lose this thread. You have a whole part of the book devoted to pieces on Godard's films from this 12-year decade. What, I mean, does he reflect something about what film was doing in this decade, or was he simply... Was he simply having an interesting time himself in this stretch? Uh, well, I would say both. Mm. He's just the least prejudiced person I know. He just has a completely open mind. He seems to be reacting to things as they cross his consciousness. He seems to be completely spontaneous, not laying any kind of agenda on, on his work at any particular moment in his career. Uh, he never becomes dogmatic which is something that happens even to someone, you know, as as brilliant as uh, uh, Brisson or uh, uh, Tarkovsky. You know, they decide this is the way we make movies, and that's what they stick with. Godard, I've always found, he's, even at the age of close to 80 now, if not over, uh, still looking for fresh approaches, you know, still confounding people with this work. And when you read interviews with him when you see him at press conferences, you know, that, that brain is just percolating along at an incredible speed. I just uh, continually stimulated by, by what he comes up with. And the, the, the presence he has, the presence he has in your book, In When Movies Mattered, you write about him in some of these pieces as having had that exciting time in his career when he kicked it off in in the early 60s with Breathless and then had a good eight, nine-year stretch there where he made many movies that people still regard as classics of that time, still often watch. And then, I don't want to get this wrong, but you seem to describe him as falling into falling into a more maybe didactic zone in his work that was harder to swallow for a lot of viewers, perhaps. And then oh, yeah. sort of coming back back, you might say, in the late 70s, early 80s? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, after 68, he uh, fell in with uh, a lot of uh, extremist uh, politics, and it became kind of an article of faith with him that movies were not supposed to be pleasurable anymore. Uh, he stopped working 
in 35 millimeter. He obviously stopped working with movie stars, with the exception of Tuvat Bien with Jane Fonda. That created a whole different set of problems for him. <laughs> he and the people he were working with it really cut themselves off from the structures of commercial cinema. And for a lot of uh, people, particularly American critics, it was as if he just disappeared after the La Chinoise. Uh, and in fact, he was making more movies than ever. They were just being seen by fewer and fewer people. And indeed, they were more and more difficult and less and less pleasurable in, in many cases. Uh, and then in 1980, he comes back to 35 millimeter and comes back to movie stars and comes back to some sort of storytelling impulse with every man for himself. And suddenly, uh, everyone thinks that Godard is back. In fact, Godard has never been away. But he's back to, I mean, he, he even calls every man for himself his second first film. And that seems significant to me. It's, it seems like he thought he was coming, if not coming back, uh, making a return to, this is a cliche, but to his kind of roots or to uh, his, his, early, his early excitement, his early sensibility. Uh, I, I can't quite find the words for this, but does that make sense? I think he breaks away from dogmatic political positions around that point and gets interested again in the qualities of the image. A certain amount of... <sighs> Spiritual transcendental concerns that come creeping in around the you know really hardcore materialism of the of the Marxist period, particularly in a film like uh, Passion, which is probably my favorite regard from the from the eighties. He's uh, you know suddenly God makes a reappearance in these movies, and uh, not from a religious point of view, but you know considered as a, a philosophical possibility that there's something beyond the exchange of money and goods. And that, you know, art has, as well as its instructional value, it has its purely useless aesthetic beauty, uh, which is a value, too, uh, that comes searching back in his work uh, in the 80s. And there, there's a word you've used that, that twice about uh, about Godard, and uh, this is, you know, one, one thing I want to touch on about him, is you've used the word dogmatic to describe what he is not cinematically, and dogmatic to describe what he was ideologically for a time. I mean, am I drawing the line correctly here that he he's he's never been dogmatic in terms of his art, but he has been dogmatic in terms of what he conveys with his art? Well, he certainly went through that period in the post-68 environment. There was a real powerful sense of what was politically correct, and I think he towed the line for for many years there, and then he, he shook that off at some point. There are some other figures in this in this period in this twelve year decade of of when movies mattered. Your book that that seem also you know there I see them as important when I read you write about them. They're not always the figures that I read other critics write about as important. But that's the good thing is I want to hear every critic call out different important figures, and um, you know people hardly ever talk about Godard and say Albert Brooks together in the same sentence. Yeah. But, you know you you convinced me that. These are two, maybe two equally formerly experimental filmmakers in their own way. I mean, I'm glibly calling them equally experimental. Do you think that's actually true? I guess if I have a critical credo, it's that all films are created equal. I, I try not to judge things differently uh, if they're a Hollywood film, if they're an avant-garde film, if it's a, a European uh, art house film. Everything kind of gets the same break with me. Uh, to begin with, I don't like to read intentionality into stuff. Uh, if I can look at the movie and see, in the case of Albert Brooks, that he's using the camera in a very distinctive way and trying to communicate a certain a Brooksian metaphysics, uh, you know, you can prove that more or less by pointing to the images. I can't demonstrate that by saying, "Well, Albert Brooks has been seeing a lot of uh, Jean-Marie Straub films," which I sincerely doubt. But their interests do sort of overlap a lot of ways. Indeed, in the piece, you mentioned that it, the, the unlikelihood that he's been, that Brooks had been following these threads himself, that he came to, that he came to the formal adventurousness he uses in a film like Lost in America in, in, in separately, independently, in, individually? Well, I, I guess so. You know, I, clearly some of these ideas were just in the air 
at the time, and then Brooks, being a, a smart guy, is able to uh, absorb them. But he certainly absorbs them in a different way than uh, Stroud Wee did, who came from a fine arts tradition, uh, as opposed to uh, a vaudeville tradition, which is what Albert Brooks comes from. <laughs> There's the, the just looking over some of the films you've included here, some of the the pieces you've included, the 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 range of filmmakers impresses me. I mean, putting Godard and Albert Brooks in the same book is enough to make me interested. But also, I mean, they appear alongside. You've got a piece on Terence Malick's Days of Heaven, which you know maybe a reader of film criticism would expect to see a critic write about. Of course, it came out in 78, and now we think of it as as a very important film, at least I do. But at the time, you know, reading your piece, it seems like you had to be, you had to be a defender of Days of Heaven. This, it was not by any means decided that that film was an important film, right? Oh, by no means. Uh, the important movie that year was The Deer Hunter, yes. which had big social themes, and it was about Vietnam, and how guilty we all were, and and that was the sort of thing that was really occupying those critics' attention. Yeah, I mean, uh, a number of the pieces in that book are a little more contentious than they would be if I written them today, just because of the context uh, they were written in. Yeah, I was, I suppose, downplaying uh, directors like. Uh, Scorsese and Altman and, and Coppola, uh, just because I thought they were being covered quite sufficiently in the mainstream press and, and pushing people who I thought uh, weren't being appreciated enough. And sometimes the rhetoric gets a little little violent, but <laughs> those were the days, you know. Uh, I could have gone back and uh, softened some of those things, but I decided not to. I mean, this is, this is how they were written. This is how, uh, this is what the times were like. I've read in other interviews that I've read you say in, in years past that you, you didn't want to go back and look at old pieces. You, you would rather leave those be and not have to, not have to face them again, perhaps. I mean, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm extrapolating, but you've, you've said in other places that you didn't want to go back to what you've written before. And I guess I want to know what turned you around. Uh, what turned me around was a very nice editor named Rodney Powell at the <laughs> University of Chicago Press who came up with the idea for this and and made it possible. You know, I don't keep copies of my old pieces. I never think to look up and see what I've already written about such, such a director when I'm writing a new story. I I don't want to be reliant on past impressions that may have changed. Uh, I don't know. I didn't like a lot of writers and a lot of filmmakers I know. When you read your old stuff, all you see are the mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not helpful, you know, uh, after a certain point. But looking back on these, you had to have seen more than mistakes, because if you'd only seen those, you probably would have put a stop to the project, right? Uh, I think this is one of those moments in life when you just say, if somebody else thinks it's a good idea, it must be a good idea. Oh, so you and, do just see the mistakes still. Uh, it's still tough for me to <laughs> to look at that old stuff. And uh, the proofreading was... <laughs> <laughs> was not a pleasant process, but that's my own hang-up, and I don't think I'm alone in feeling that way, but uh, obviously I, I would be better off without it. But there had to be moments as well where, beyond, beyond cringing at what you wrote back then, there had to be moments where you said to yourself, you know, wow, my, my views on this film or this filmmaker or what have you, have have really changed. I mean, have there been any stark changes in your, I don't know if judgments is the right word, but in the way you think about these movies since to the point where you would not agree with yourself who wrote these reviews in the 70s and the 80s? Not in a large sense, no. Probably in some details. Uh, but no, I don't, I don't think so. There's nothing I would uh, repudiate in that material. I see more sins of omission, I think. Yeah. You know, I was a very serious young man, and at the time I was overlooking a lot of uh, really interesting work that was going on in uh, in comedies, just because uh, what John Landis was doing seemed a little too frivolous at the time. But now when I see Landis's films, I think they're marvelous reflections of, of 
the time they came out. It's just you know, full of anarchic energy and a joy in filmmaking that uh, really thrills me. But this is something I hear so many critics and filmmakers say. You know, both of both of them alike, they'll they'll say they they undervalued comedy and lightness early on. I mean, is that a pattern you mm-hmm. see in, in in them as well? I mean, it's something you see in yourself. But I feel like mo- many, if not most, critics and filmmakers I talk to, they're kind of like, yeah, I was a little too serious to begin with. Well, that's a good observation. Yeah, I would not be surprised. Do you see it in? I mean, in directors that you that you watch? John Lennon, I believe, was it? I was I was so much older then. I'm younger than that now. And <laughs> there's a lot of truth in that. An appropriate quote, certainly. I mean, looking looking at the bodies of work of of directors that you've been fascinated by, and I want to talk about some more of them. Is is that a pattern you see? I mean, you've you've watched or you've watched. These, these directors come along, or in some cases, you know, directors who've already passed or finished working, you've been able to assess their, their bodies of work whole. Maybe, maybe I'm just making it up, but often there is a move toward lightness, is there not? Or if not lightness, some kind of like nihilistic uh, humor, right? Um, yeah. I uh, just think that uh, when Arthur Penn uh, died a few months ago, I took the chance to look at his last film again, which is this very strange movie called Penn and Teller Get Killed. Oh, yes. You know, here's a man just working with total freedom at the end of his career. He's got nothing to prove to anybody. There's absolutely no reason why he should have made this movie. <laughs> and it's just one of this beautiful, gratuitous, completely personal film that uh, you know, it's just a marvel. And he, I really can't imagine him making that movie at the time he was making the great social pronouncements of little big man and, and, uh, and pictures like that. You, know, you, you have to move beyond that in some way. You have a couple pieces on, on late films in late, late films of certain directors in the book. And I'm thinking specifically of uh, family plot, a 1976 Hitchcock film. And, you know, to some people saying a Hitchcock film from 1976 almost sounds like a contradiction. He seems so much like a creature of the era before then, and uh, you have uh, John Cassavetti's Love Streams from 84, which, for all intents and purposes, is the, the last real Cassavetti's film. Mm-hmm. And these, these stand out in, in, I would say, in both of these directors' filmographies because, because they seem like they came too late. They came outside of the, the director's eras, even though they were both alive then. But, I mean, are they, are they really the kind of outliers that a casual viewer would assume they were or that that even I kind of do I mean are they odd ducks in in the context of the work of Hitchcock and Cassavetes or do you see them more as like continuations of what they were doing of just ne- the natural next and final step for them I would see both of those as pretty natural continuations mm. uh, Hitchcock obviously was a very old man and wasn't able to do the detail work uh, that he like to do on his movies. You know, he, he farmed out a lot of the process shots to assist in ADs and, and things that he would have never done before. And, you know, his, his energy is flagging somewhat, but it's still very much his movie. Uh, no one else could have made that film. It, it was, in the case of Cassavetes, I don't think he knew that was his last film. Uh, I, I would be curious. I'm not sure when he discovered it that he had uh, the cancer that eventually killed him, but uh, I don't have the impression from watching that that it's it's conscious of coming at a twilight moment the way that I'm sure Hitchcock was conscious that uh, Family Plot was coming toward the end. Although he did have another film scripted and ready to go uh, after that one that you didn't live to make. And, you know, speaking of of directors in later stages of their careers, I can't help but bring this up because you have a, a piece on uh, Manuel de Oliveira's Francisca in 1983 that says, you know, wow. <laughs> Here's a director, 70, 75 years old, end of his, you know, end of his time, and he's coming back. And now the man's 102, and I think he's preparing his next film. I mean, what, what would you have thought back then if somebody told you, no, this guy's going to be past 100 and showing no signs of stopping? Well, that shows you. You should make any uh, snap judgments about these things. And, you know, <laughs> it turned out that 75, he was still a pretty young director. Right, yeah. It was in, his, in terms of his career, it was, I mean, if not early, then in the, the middle. Well, that was the moment when he was uh, being rediscovered and uh, was finally able to start making films on a regular basis instead of once every 10 or 15 years as he as he had for a long time, since the 30s. So I guess you know that was a rebirth for, for Oliveira, and uh, he uh, continues to behave like a, 
<laughs> the youngest director out there. <laughs> and the, you know, at a certain point, I guess there has to be, you know, again, I don't, as you said before, there's, there's no point in trying to guess what a director's own thoughts or motivations are, but it does seem like, yeah, I guess once you get past your 95th, 100th birthday, there is a certain freedom that you that you attain as well, you know, saying this may or may not be my last film, but I have a substantial body of work, I have a substantial life, so let's let's see, let's see what I can make. Let's just go for it, right? I mean, is that is that the impression you get from his more recent films, the ones that he's made in the last 20 years or so, or have you followed him closely? Uh, oh yeah, he's still one of my favorite filmmakers. Mm. I I think in his case, you know, he was lucky enough to age into a time when uh, not only was his work appreciated, but there was a certain amount of production money uh, available to support it. And uh, he's been able to work with a regularity that uh, you know, very few directors of any age uh, are able to achieve anymore. More coincidental, I think, than... Uh, symptomatic of, uh, of, of something that's going on. Yeah, I certainly knew that Bud Bedecker was a magnificent director of Westerns from the 1950s, and his career uh, came to an end in uh, the 60s for reasons completely beyond his control, and he lived you know, well into his 80s uh, in a state of perpetual total frustration, just unable to make anything. And it's just such a tragic loss that this great, great filmmaker uh, basically wasn't allowed to work. So for every Oliveira, there's a, there's a Bedecker whose career is cut off prematurely. Just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas, and I'm Colin Marshall. My guest is film critic Dave Kerr, who's written for the Chicago Reader, the Chicago Tribune, the New York Times, and now he's got a new book called When Movies Mattered, Reviews from a Transformative Decade. Let me ask you this. How would you like weekly updates on all things Marketplace of Ideas? News on current and upcoming interviews, plus related internet interestingness and other writings I can fit in there? Well, it's the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list that'll give you all of that every week to your inbox. You can sign up by going to colinmarshallradio.com. Very simple details right there on the front page of the Marketplace of Ideas site. Go to colinmarshallradio.com, click the Marketplace of Ideas, and there you'll see how to sign up for the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. Now, right on back to the conversation with critic Dave Kerr on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. Now, can that still happen, do you think? I mean, given how low the barriers to filmmaking have fallen, can a filmmaker still be shut out in that same way in, in the 2010s as they could have been in the 1960s when it was no it was no small order to be able to even get your hands on the gear necessary to make films? Well, you have to adjust your, your uh, expectations. You know, directors who are used to working in 35 millimeter with big crews have a hard time shifting down to uh, digital video shoots. And I don't really know very many who've even tried. A, a great example of a very, very, very good filmmaker who just isn't able to get anything going these days is Joe Dante, mm. who uh, is still is just you know, full of ideas and energy and should be making a movie a year. Uh, and yet his stuff uh, is somehow falls in between the cracks. It's not as a a horror filmmaker, it's not gory and sadistic enough for the teenage audience. It's a little too scary for the youth audience. Uh, and it's, it's hard to find a production niche that he fits into. Any of that man's ideas certainly need a budget, though. I mean, he's not going out there like Mike Figgis with some digital video cameras. He's Anything Joe Dante thinks up, you, you come up with a 10, 20 million before that thing is going to be realized, right? Uh, not necessarily. He made a, a nice low-budget picture called The Hole uh, mm. two years ago in in 3D. And it, uh, Joe is someone who loves the old uh, the gimmick filmmakers, William Castle and so on, and his feeling for 3D is really magnificent. And the film has yet to get uh, the actual distribution in the United States, uh, just by having played at a number of uh, festivals in Europe and and elsewhere, and it's a very good movie, but it falls in between the cracks. It's just not scary enough for the Final Destination crowd, and it's uh, too scary for the 
I don't know, Chronicles of Narnia crowd. <laughs> <laughs> but to connect to connect the material you've collected in When Movies Mattered to today, you know, I was thinking about directors you write about in the book who are still alive, who are still getting their movies seen, who maybe aren't encountering those same sorts of problems that you mentioned Joe Dante having. And, you know, there there's only a few of them, but mostly you know, we mentioned Terrence Malick, we mentioned Days of Heaven, and the, the film that's on everybody's mind right now who's in that cinephilic circle is uh, The Tree of Life. Would you Would you look forward to uh, Tree of Life with the same type of anticipation that you would have looked forward to whatever Malick would have followed up Days of Heaven with, assuming that hadn't been 20 years later with A Thin Red Line. I mean, is this is is there a continuity, I guess, with, with the filmmakers who are going today as they were going then? I mean, do you, are they the same directors to you? I mean, let's say Malick specifically, is he the same director to you now that he was then? It sounds like a ridiculous question. Of course he is, but, you know, in well, some sense... Well, it's not a ridiculous question at all, and I think uh, he's a great example of someone whose work has been influenced by changes in technology. Mm. Uh, when he was shooting 35mm film, or 70mm film in the case of uh, Days of Heaven, uh, he was a mise-en-scene director. He was about uh, the image, the composition of the frame. And now he's become a uh, montage director because digital encourages rapid, easy editing. You know, lots of constant fussing around, which is what he seems to be addicted to right now. <laughs> I liked his last couple films less than before. Obviously, a Eddie Terry Malick film is a major event, and I'm dying to see this one. But I am not quite as excited about it as I might have been... Uh, uh, before he uh, discovered uh, digital editing, I, I bring up his name especially because, you know, he he is the I would say the most I don't want to say most alive because of course Godard, as we mentioned, very much alive, very much working. He's a bit older, um, and uh, you know he drums up a bit less excitement in some parts of the world with his, with his films than Malick might with one of his. But you know, Malick seems to be the main the main human thread working in the industry that connects that, that connects the films you write about in this book to today. I mean, is it is it more appropriate for me to talk about the actual people who were making films then, who are still doing it today, to sort of draw a line between then and now in, in filmmaking and in cinephilia? Or should I, should I be talking about directors who might not have been born then or might not have been working then, who sort of carry on the spirit of, of this time, you know, who still make movies as if movies mattered today in the same way they mattered then. I mean, should I be talking about the actual people or a spirit? You know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I wonder how much of that uh, openness that Goddard and Malik were able to thrive on in the 70s is still available today. Uh, certainly not in Hollywood. Increasingly, I wonder about Europe, unless you're a superstar like Goddard and, and you can you can do what you want. Um, and more and more, it seems uh, things are very tightly constrained to a certain number of formulas, uh, way too much market research going on, way too many things being tweaked uh, according to how audiences respond to questionnaires, which has really killed, I think, Hollywood commercial filmmaking. Very hard for a young director to develop a personality in the Hollywood film when you're being second-guessed constantly by the research department and you get to make one movie every at best two or three years whereas the guys we tend to admire from the past the Walsh's and the Hawks's and the Ford's were making at the beginning three, four, five films a year uh, that's how you you learn to direct I think. those opportunities aren't there anymore but does does the advent of more accessible filmmaking technology, you know, the, the sort of the way that video has come along to look, if not as good as film, to look respectable, to have some actual vividness, to have some some film like a depth of field, you know, the way that oh, yeah. the the way that the means of production, to, if I want to sound Marxist, have really <laughs> been have really been handed out to even literally kids who want to make films. Does that not give you a little bit of hope as far as films that are out of the mainstream? Hollywood might not be knocking on their doors, but won't they get somehow made and somehow seen? 
Well, they're certainly getting made by the the thousands, and the problem is that they're not getting seen. Uh, I've you know, been on various film festival selection committees over the years, and have you know, some sense of how many hundreds, if not thousands, of entries you get for like the New York Film Festival, which has exactly twenty five slots for movies, and there are online sites that do nothing but distribute undistributed indie films. And there are thousands and thousands of them, and I'm sure in there there's some really good stuff, but I have no idea how to find it. You know, the, the names don't mean anything to me. You can't ever really tell much from the subjects. How these things rise to the top, it's become very difficult. You know, uh, the uh, distributors are looking, again, for very formulaic, very circumscribed kind of films. You know, their idea of an indie film is the kids are all right, oh, which yes. is like something, you know, Stanley Kramer would have made in 1960 <laughs> in exactly the same way. <laughs> right. you know, there's there's nothing unusual about that movie. And, uh, yeah, I mean, just, I have to take it as an article of faith that that stuff is out there, and I'm just, I'm not finding it. Maybe people who are going to festivals, which I'm really not anymore, are digging up things. I read uh, you know, publications like Cinemascope out of Canada, which is full of directors I've never heard of. I've never seen their films. I'm very curious to see them. But if you're not on that festival circuit, you're not, you're not going to encounter them. It does become a matter of, of finding, you know, of, of, of filtering, I suppose. And to, to bring it back to the very thing we're talking about, or with it we've been talking about, that's always, the filtering was always what I have looked to critics for you know as a lover of film criticism the critics have always been my guide through the thicket of what's out there i mean it was as long as i can remember it's films have been sort of a bewildering a bewildering forest of options and you know is that is that a, a way you think about criticism at all just as as being as being a guide through the the, the noise the i don't know how many metaphors i'm going to pull out for this but well yeah, the kind of criticism I've done, which is journalistic criticism and you know, popular media, uh, I think a large component of it is the, the service factor. You know, I suffer, so you don't have to, to some degree. <laughs> or, you know, I, I'm able, because it's my job, to watch 10 or 12 movies a week, of which I can recommend two or three, maybe. Yeah, yeah, but I think even uh, for full-time professionals, it's become completely impossible to keep up with the amount of stuff that's coming out. Nobody can dive into some of these uh, BitTorrent sites, you know, where people post their their homemade movies and, and watch all the 2,000 titles that are posted up there. You know, and I bet you a couple of those are pretty good. <laughs> but Probably. You know, how do you find them? Do you have any hope at all for this situation? Well, <laughs> I don't want to sound too gloomy because I am... Yeah, uh, basically a hopeful person, and I, you know, uh, new technology uh, always cuts in in two directions. You know, it's not a continual ascent, and it's not a continual decline. Uh, it's give and take, and you know, certainly with this new accessibility, new means of distribution, the possibility for new voices to emerge is there, but the. Uh, the structures haven't really developed yet to support that, to to let those voices be heard or you know even discovered by members outside of their immediate family. It's uh, it's tricky. You know, I don't. If I were a publicist, if I were a distributor today, I don't know how how do you promote a movie that's premiering on Netflix out of the five hundred new titles that enter Netflix every every month. I have no idea. Really don't. Well, structure makers of the world, cinematic structure makers, you have your task laid out for you. The book, once again, is When Movies Mattered, reviews from a transformative decade. Dave, thanks so much for taking the time today. Well, thank you, Carl. It was a real pleasure. If you'd like to learn more about Dave Kerr, visit Dave Kerr, D A V E K E H R. Dot com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. If you want to hear this conversation again, find it at colinmarshallradio.com or on iTunes. 
Just search for the Marketplace of Ideas in the iTunes Store. The website of Ben Althaus, the man who makes our theme music, is available, as always, at benalthaus.com. And if you'd like weekly updates on everything going on with the Marketplace of Ideas, current interviews, upcoming interviews, related interestingness on the Internet, sign up for the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. You can find details on colinmarshallradio.com. Questions, comments, any kind of feedback, don't hesitate to send it along. Help us improve the show to Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. It's Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Thank you, as always, for listening. We'll catch you next time on The Marketplace of Ideas for more cultural conversation of the depth you demand.